In the 1950s, America had broken free from the shackles of wartime economics. It was walking with the swagger of a nation that had the world by the tail. Scientists had harnessed nuclear energy. Jet-propelled airplanes were breaking speed records, and the race to space was on. But perhaps more than anything else, one thing melded imagination and consumerism, putting this era in perfect context. The concept car. Unlike satellites, rockets, and jet planes, these dream cars were accessible. People flocked to auto shows to see concept cars in their titanium-bodied glory. They were snapshots of how America perceived its future. They were simply out of sight, unforgettable. But what happened to them? Most were destroyed. Some just plain vanished. But amazingly, some are still here. Introducing the 1938 Phantom Corsair. The spectacular toy of a millionaire playboy. He was looking for something that was going to be unlike anything on the streets in Hollywood. And introducing the 1954 Packard Panther. A formidable piece of fiberglass. The car was 17 feet long, and they didn't have any ribs or anything much in the car for strength, so they had to make it an inch thick. There are over 200 eye-catching vehicles at Reno's National Automobile Museum. But there is one long, low, black car that grabs your attention with a clenched fist and doesn't let go. It sucks the air out of the room. It's a dynamic presence. It's just a showstopper. People are just shocked and amazed and in awe of the automobile. It is the 1938 Phantom Corsair, and it is unlike anything that has ever come before or since. The Phantom Corsair is a creation of a 25-year-old millionaire playboy named Rust Hines. Russ Tynes was the heir to the 57 Varieties fortune. He was the grandson of H.J. Hines, founder of Hines Foods. While most of the Hines family lived in Pittsburgh, Rust was drawn to the bright lights of Hollywood. He was driving in 1936 Cord. Now he decides he wants something even flashier than that, so he sketches out on a cocktail napkin this long, sleek, aerodynamic vehicle. Takes the uh, drawings and such to Bowman and Schwartz in Pasadena, California. They were a noted coach builder, built many high-end automobiles for the rich and famous. They take Russ 36 court, they strip the drivetrain out of it, the rear axle and the instruments, and they throw the rest of the car away. <laughs> so literally from the tires up, this automobile has been built there in Pasadena. He's not taking styling cues from anything else on the road or anything anybody's even thinking about building. This is an entirely personal design. You have this long, narrow nose here to cut the wind. It also hides the transmission assembly and the cords 
the engine is turned around backwards to get the front wheel drive. So the transmission sits up front, the engine sits in the back, it drives out through the front wheels on, through a four-speed transmission. So it's a normally aspirated 289 cubic inch Lycoming L-head V8. The engine produced 190 horsepower and gave the Phantom a top speed of 115 miles an hour. There is very little chrome on the car. For the most part, it's a dark shadowy form. But on the leading edge, Rust put on a bold and shiny triplane fender. That was just the beginning of his innovations. To get this aerodynamic look and a nearly teardrop shape to the automobile, the car is widened in the front end to flip over the front wheels. The front seat has room for four people, with the driver sitting second from the left. It's got a lot of room, obviously, being so you're mostly in the middle. You have lots of arm space and, and such as to move around. When you get four people in the front space, it's still not too bad. And uh, when we've taken it into shows, my wife usually sits here on the left. The problem with Phantom Corsair is, I think, I'm not sure if he was looking to see, trying to make the automobile hard to see into, but it's definitely hard to see out of. You're much taller than I am. You're going to have to crouch down real good to see through here. A bit like an armored car. The other problem is, of course, these huge blind quarters. Sitting in the middle of this wide automobile, it's very difficult to see what's going on in traffic on either side of you. Rust Hines was a very social young man, so his car was built for entertaining. The interior, all leather, lined in cork for silencing and heat insulation. There's two seats in the back for passengers to face to the rear, so it's actually a six-place automobile. So you they would climb over the top and face the rear. There's also cabinets mounted on both sides, liquor cabinets and uh, tumbler dispensers and such for the personal items there. The style didn't stop there. The Phantom Corsair was built to impress, both coming and going. Quite possibly my favorite angle on the automobile is from the rear, taking in this boat tail and the, the way the pontoon fenders mold into the automobile here, the enclosed license plate, the singular exhaust tip, uh, and then again the triplane bumper. The car often gets compared to the Batmobile, but it actually predates the Dark Knight's first car by three years. So rather than rust stealing from the comic books, it's more likely that it happened the other way around. Because it wasn't affiliated with a major automaker, the Phantom didn't do the typical car show circuit. It did make the New York Auto Show a special display there. You know, I'm sure it wowed the crowd as it always has. Um, other than that, uh, I don't find any other record of it showing up anyplace else. I know, you know, wherever it went, I'm sure it drew a crowd. Many people refer to it as like a boulevard car. It was really something to be seen in. Rust made sure he was seen in it, parked out front of Beverly Hills nightclubs and cruising up and down the Sunset Strip. The Phantom even had a brief film career appearing in the 1938 movie, The Young in Heart. You mustn't hit anything when we're going this fast, darling. They do some interesting special effects in that movie, so you appear to walk into the flying wombat dealership, as it was called in the film, and it appears like there's eight or ten of the automobiles sitting on a showroom floor, but there was only ever one. Having multiple Phantom Corsairs lined up in a real dealership is exactly what Rust had in mind. He went so far as to make a brochure and discuss it with the folks at Bowman and Schwartz, you know, what would be the possibility of recreating the automobile. You know, it was a $25,000 car to build for himself, which is a huge amount of money. He hoped to be able to build it for a little less than half of that. But that's still, you know, twelve to $14,000 when you can buy a brand new Ford for about 800 bucks. Uh, that's a lot of car. 
Just one year after building his dream car, Rust Hines's charmed life took a tragic turn. They're coming back late at night in an open car. Somebody's hat blows off and the driver decides to make a U-turn and go back and get it. Rust Hines was a 25-year-old millionaire when he dreamed up the incredible Phantom Corsair in 1938. He was living a glamorous life in Hollywood while the rest of his family made ketchup back in Pittsburgh. 1939, he takes a trip back east to visit family. He goes out one evening with friends. They're coming back late at night in an open car. Somebody's hat blows off and the driver decides to make a U-turn and go back and get it. At that point, the automobile is broadsided and the next morning, Russ has died. The Hines family wanted nothing to do with Rust's creation, so they sold off the car as quickly as possible. Since then, it has passed through the hands of racing legend Andy Granatelli, Hollywood producer Herb Schreiner, and casino mogul Bill Hera. It's now displayed at the National Automobile Museum in Reno, Nevada. There's a lot of aerodynamic designs, a lot of sleek, low-profiled automobiles, but it's hard to come up with anything that compares with that machine. In 1999, more than 60 years after its creation, the Phantom Corsair did make it into production, albeit in miniature. Mattel selected it to be part of their first edition series of Hot Wheels. Even more recently, the car has attracted a new generation of fans, thanks to an appearance in a video game. It appeared in the uh, L.A. Noir game, and then it brought a whole group of young people in that were looking just for that automobile, because they found out it was from the game where it was. Popular with the young and old, the Phantom Corsair is one of the most famous concept cars in the world. The design is truly unique. It just doesn't take any cues from anybody. He was looking for something that was going to be unlike anything on the streets in Hollywood, which is a pretty tough call. I mean, that's a, always has been a car culture. There's many unique vehicles running around there. Of course, Cars of the Stars and the, and the Rich and Famous and such but the Phantom Corsair really stood on its own. In 1938, Rust Hines wanted a spectacular car to boost his own personal profile. In 1954, Packard needed a car to prop up the entire company. Like the cat it's named for, the Packard Panther is long, sleek, and fast. But no matter how fast it drove, it could never outrun the company's financial problems. Since the early 1900s, Packard Motor Car Company had been considered one of America's preeminent manufacturers. In fact, in the teens, it was said the three Ps, Pierce Arrow, Peerless, and Packard, were the cars to have. That was the gold standard. And even up into the late 1930s, Packard still had that mark as the top luxury automobile manufacturer. Unfortunately, uh, Packard really uh, kind of lost that image after World War II. In the late 1940s, the American auto sector was in overdrive. Returning soldiers were buying up new cars as fast as they could be built. Packard drove headfirst into that market, but paid a heavy price. They left the uh, luxury market really uh, for what they felt were greener pastures, but diminished their reputation in the process. They had sacrificed their credibility for volume 
and within a few short years found themselves in over their heads. By the mid-1950s, Packard had some quality control issues and also uh, some production issues. Their factory situation was very unsettled and caused some problems uh, all the way into the showrooms. In an effort to show the motoring world that the company was alive and well, they hired Dick Teague, a big name in the auto world at the time, and asked him to put Packard back on the map. They build cars for, uh, for auto shows to get people's attention and uh, the look, the style, and everything. I can remember as a boy, my father coming home from um, the auto show in Toronto and talking about all these new things and the new suspension and all the new the look and everything. And he, was, he was an excited guy. I remember that as a kid. The car that captured the imagination of so many fathers and sons was the Panther. It was unlike anything Packard or any other company had ever created. It's a two-seat roadster with a low, sleek body. The top of the front wheel wells are flattened over the top of the tires to further lower the car's profile. The rear wheels are partly covered with skirts, adding to its aerodynamic looks and its performance. The Panther was also the first Packard to employ a wraparound windshield, something they included in their production models the very next year. Under the hood, Packard lived up to its reputation for power and performance. It's a 359 uh, straight eight with a McCullough supercharger on it and 275 horse. That's about as big as they could come up with, I think, at the time. Packard took it to the annual Speed Week races at Daytona Beach that year, where it was clocked at 110 miles an hour on the sand and more than 130 miles an hour on the road. Big, beautiful, and fast, the Panther seemed to be everything the car buying public was clamoring for in 1954. But in the end, it wasn't enough. For the first half of the 20th century, Packard was one of the most respected brands in the car business. They called it the three P's. It was Packard, Peerless, and um, Pierce Arrow, the three P's. And if you own that, you were doing okay. But by the mid-1950s, they had fallen on hard times. When the war was on, they were busy building equipment, and maybe they didn't pay attention to the style. And they just went ahead and started building cars again without upgrading their look. So in 1954, they did a complete about-face and released a gorgeous concept car called the Panther. It was a brand new look for the company, bigger and bolder than anything they had built before. It was even made of a new material. The year before, General Motors had stunned the world with their little Corvette. A tiny sports car made out of fiberglass. The Panther used the same material, but on a body that was a full five feet longer. The car was 17 feet long, and they didn't have any ribs or anything much in the car for strength, so they had to make it an inch thick, the fiberglass, for basically strength. For everything that was new about it, Packard did keep one very important feature from their past. Packard was noted for their radiator shape. We have a 199 Packard in our family, and it's the same shape. You could tell it was a Packard by the shape of the grill. Even a keychain fob or like a watch fob, you'd have, I've seen them with that shape on them. And, you know, you'd have your watch and the Packard emblem would be on it. So it's always that red, red shell shape. The Panther embellished that historic styling cue 
by continuing the front edge of the hood over the headlights and along the sides of the body. They built four show cars, identical except for their painting schemes, and toured them around the country. The cars were wildly popular, maybe too much so. Riding high on the concept's popularity, Packard bought out Studebaker, another struggling automaker. This new acquisition proved to be more than they could handle. Well, Studebaker and uh, Packard merged, and they were both failing, and they were trying to survive. They thought they could help each other, and they did do their best. They tried, and they made some nice cars, uh, but the public didn't think so, and it failed. In 1958, just four years after the Panther's impressive debut, Packard filed for bankruptcy. That left the Panthers as orphans. They were sold off with the company's assets and disappeared into private collections. Two exist, as far as I know, and uh, uh, the other two were destroyed. You know, to see that, a, that any show car from that period survived is a miracle. So many times these things would be taken back and, you know, cut up for scrap, and that's, uh, you know, more often than not, that's what happened. The silver one recently sold at auction for $900,000 to a private and secretive owner. It's still in top shape and very drivable. A rolling tribute to Packard's mechanical prowess. I really appreciate seeing cars driving. And there's so many museums, and it's nice that they have them, and the cars are saved but they're um, kind of prisoners in the museum, in my opinion. To see something actually start and run, and a guy doesn't have to drive it to work, but he can at least get it out and show it, show it to people that it does work. And um, obviously this car worked. The Phantom Corsair and the Packard Panther were both very large cars with powerful engines. But both cars proved to be powerless as they were caught up in events much larger than their own impressive frames and motors. In 